Hello, everyone. My name is Faith Taylor, and I will be presenting the beginning part of our class presentation on how we were working to develop an environmental justice index for the Chesapeake Watershed Report Card. So to begin, I think it's important that we define environmental justice and the EPA defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies. However, although this is the nice concise definition of environmental justice, environmental justice is actually a lot more complex and a lot more nuanced than what can be captured in just one single agency definition or really just one definition. So environmental injustices can extend beyond this spectrum and include a plethora of other issues, including homelessness, pollution, water quality, air quality, mass incarceration, police brutality, food insecurity, food apartheid, and a whole host access to green space and a whole host of other concerns. Um, and then why does environmental justice matter? Because the communities that are most often overburdened with environmental disamenities and environmental hazards tend to be black and brown communities and low income communities in the United States. And these are the same communities that have been left out of the mainstream environmental movement and have also received the le least access to environmental services like green space. So we see a huge gap in where the, envir the mainstream environmental movement has focused. And these communities have consistently been underserved in the ways that we talk about environmentalism and the environmental justice movement really helps to fill in those gaps. And when you're developing an environmental justice index, there are pros and cons associated with doing that type of work. Some of the pros are that it can be used for education, can help build scientific awareness, and it can also serve as an index for comparison. Depending on the variables that you choose, those variables can be directly compared across different geospatial scales. However, there are a lot of cons associated with doing this type of work as well. For example, it requires a lot of ground truthing. So to be able to build environmental justice index, you have to be heavily involved with communities and see what community concerns are. Um, so you have to spend the time to build those relationships to accurately reflect those experiences into the tool. You're also limited by data availability. So environmental justice tools aggregate usually publicly available data sets. And with that being said, there might be an indicator of environmental injustice in a community, but if there's no publicly available data set or no collected data set on that indicator at the scale of which you need it across all of these different areas, then you're not going to be able to integrate that concern into a tool. So they're fundamentally limited by data accessibility. And then there's also a lack of funding to do this type of work. As I mentioned previously, environmental justice has not been a main concern of the mainstream environmental movement. So the funding to do this type of work has always been lacking. And they're also prone to bias and misrepresentation of community concerns. So people who are making these tools bring a whole host of their own personal biases, both implicit and explicit biases, and then those biases will get re-reflected back into the tool. And you can also misrepresent community concerns by not having those adequate relationships that are built in those communities of concern to make sure that their interests are being well reflected into the tool. So if you haven't done the work to build those relationships with community members, then you will misrepresent their concerns. And then some of the potential indicators that we came up with for environmental justice as a class are some of the ones that I mentioned earlier, but this is a screenshot from an exercise we did as a class. Some of the things that our class was considered considered um, as potential indicators of environmental injustice are food security, exposure to pollutants, environmental quality, access to green space, socioeconomic status, reduced health outcomes, homelessness, race, and ethnicity, all of those things contribute to environmental injustice. And then there's also a whole host of other indicators that we 
as researchers, as academics, people who do not live in these communities are unaware of. So having that stakeholder engagement with community members can even expose more potential indicators of environmental injustice that aren't being thought of in the same ways that people who are in that academic silo often think about environmental injustice. And then now I will present my colleague and classmate, Katrina Kelly, and she will continue on with the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Faith. Hi, I'm Katrina from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. This environmental justice project furthers the mission of the Environment and Society Foundation of the Mies Program. This issue's study group is both a course and a mission for facilitating student learning and providing stakeholders with a viable instrument for change. Using the combined resources from the University of Maryland system, this effort, led by Drs. Bill Dennison and Vanessa Vargas Nguyen, has included lectures from frontline social justice activists and stakeholders, a skilled technical support team to coordinate our virtual environment, student colleagues from multidisciplinary backgrounds, a multi-source literature review, as well as interviews with key stakeholders. What we share here today is not a final product, but an expansion on the existing Bay Report Card and a telling of the human story of climate change and the environment. As an example, social vulnerability, an index developed by the CDC, is one aspect of what we will examine. All these resources contribute to our objective of co-producing a science product that measures the societal impacts of environmental challenges. In the following video, you will hear from my classmates about other important indicators for measuring and monitoring environmental justice. Hello, my name is Janae Lincolns. My other group member is Faith Taylor. We're both University of Maryland at College Park students in the Mies program. I'm in the mechanical engineering program. Our topic were indicators of race. The decades of environmental justice research has demonstrated that race is its largest contributing factor in the sitting of environmental amenities and burdens throughout the minority communities. These injustices can range from health disparities, housing differences, hazardous waste, climate change, and the accessibility of water. But present studies on environmental justice have often focused on major racial groups, so Black, Asian, Native American, um, Pacific Islander, Latino, White. Um, so therefore, there's a need to expand racial analysis to include racial subgroups, given that the racial groups are not monolithic and can have different experiences um, relating to environmental justice. Thank you. Households with income below the federal poverty level are disproportionately subjected to environmental injustices and have a diminished ability to respond to these injustices. Without a surplus of income, they are typically unable to relocate or acquire proper medical care. While appropriate investment in the households and neighborhoods within this population has the potential to make considerable change in the environmental conditions and injustices they experience, these investments have not been made. Therefore, considering and weighting the percentage of households in poverty will be critical as an indicator for comparison with environmental and equity indicators. In the past, housing segregation was a huge issue. There were black neighborhoods and white ones, and as historically known, these two neighborhoods did not have the same facilities or amenities. While these issues are still very current in low-income communities and communities of color, their neighborhoods are either ignored as some scientists or elected officials do not see the value in these communities. But if attention is paid to these communities and improvements are made, like a park or better infrastructure being added, these communities are then faced with gentrification, pushing the low-income citizens out or the communities of colors out of their neighborhood. Therefore, this is an extremely important issue. However, more research and data are needed to accurately track this issue. Health concerns that arise from lead exposure are neurological effects, intellectual disabilities, increased risk of high blood pressure and kidney damage, among others. 
for children the highest at risk. The CDC has identified a blood lead concentration level of five micrograms per deciliter as the threshold level, and any concentration above can lead to significant health risks occurring. In 1978, the federal government banned consumers' uses of lead containing paint, but marginalized areas in the state of Maryland have a high percentage of people, particularly children, with blood lead concentrations exceeding the threshold. Children's risks are increased due to hand-to-mouth transfer of chipping lead containing paint. Lead can be removed from the body, however, the underlying damage cannot be undone. Therefore, identifying lead exposure as an indicator will address one of the many social and health inequalities in marginalized communities. In 2001, the EPA has set 10 milligrams per liter as a standard for arsenic, nitrate, and phosphate to define what is a health water for humans. Municipal water supplies maintain these standards with EPA's oversight, but small community water systems, such as private wells, are more vulnerable toward this standard. In Maryland, private wells solely supply up to 20% of the total water supplies. Minorities with no advantages on economic rely on this small community water system to live. The disadvantages in numbers and languages make it difficult for them to get a better water supply through clinics. Therefore, an EJ indicator for access to adequate drinking water is helpful to alleviate the issue and increase the happiness index of the local residents. Climate change has increased the frequency and risk of flooding to coastal communities. And despite this increased risk, low-lying coastal areas are home to about 40% of the global population. Coastal areas around the Chesapeake Bay are particularly vulnerable to flooding as they face the impacts of both land subsidence and sea level rise. Literature has documented that socially vulnerable individuals living in coastal areas around the world will have a disproportionate exposure to flooding risk, which will likely amplify the social vulnerabilities of these areas. A coastal flooding indicator will provide data on nuisance flooding and socioeconomic characteristics of coastal areas to highlight how flooding patterns are an environmental justice issue. Therefore, this indicator can be instrumental in identifying areas where flood risk is unevenly impacting marginalized communities, which can help in the development of more equitable adaptation strategies. Hello, my name is Nyla McLean and I attend the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Today, I will be discussing wastewater treatment plant proximity and its possible use as an indicator within the Chesapeake Bay. Wastewater treatment plants are facilities used to separate sewage and water so that they may be returned to the environment. These facilities are often housed in communities of minorities as established by those in power. Bioaerosols released by these facilities can have adverse respiratory and digestive health effects on the residents, as well as giving off a smell that repels business enterprise. It is these individuals that have to suffer the harshest and most immediate consequences of combined sewer and sanitary sewer overflow, as well as lack of economic growth from low business presence. Therefore, by pairing this indicator with community demographics and locations, we will be able to identify those peoples who are placed at socioeconomic disadvantage. My name is Olivia Wolford, and I'm with the Department of Anthropology at the University of Maryland. Exposure to hazardous waste poses serious health threats to individuals and communities, and exposure to these waste sites has always disproportionately impacted Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color. Despite knowing about these inequalities, no changes have been made to zoning, and no reparations have been allocated to communities that have been subjected to this exposure. Comparing the locations of Brownfields, Superfund, and hazardous waste sites in conjunction with socioeconomic data will allow us to clearly identify which groups are being disproportionately affected in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Agriculture is present across the Chesapeake Bay, making it an important source of pollution. 
Additionally, many minority and low-income communities are disproportionately affected by pollution from farming. Runoff from the nutrients found in pesticides, fertilizers, and poultry manure can lead to an excess of nitrates and phosphates in waterways, resulting in health problems such as cancer. However, monitoring these sources of pollution are expensive and rarely accurate. Instead of directly monitoring these pollutants, we can use information from the USGS to assess nutrient levels in waterways surrounding the bay. As nitrogen is found in many fertilizers, we can use total nitrogen yields per acre to assess excessive fertilizer applications. Additionally, phosphorus is a common nutrient in pesticides and in poultry manure. Through measuring total phosphorus yields per acre, we can provide insight on further agricultural runoff. Combining phosphorus and nitrogen yields with data on socioeconomic status and race, we can provide an indicator of environmental injustices related to agriculture. With breathing being a necessity to live, it makes it nearly impossible to avoid air pollution. DMV's population is highly affected by air pollution with an increase in pollutants such as ozone and particle pollution, severe impacts on human health are increasing with high amounts of deaths and hospitalizations. Therefore, there has been a demand to find solutions to better the problems of air pollution. One of those solutions have been urban trees, which have been proven to improve air quality, temperature, and have even correlated with a decrease in crime. Scientists would like to find more solutions such as urbanized trees in hopes to decline the amount of air pollution. Racial and ethnic minorities are exposed to greater levels of air pollution, particularly in neighborhoods with high levels of segregation. The air toxicity can be linked to a large amount of both short-term and long-term health impacts. The 2014 National Air Toxics Assessment of Cancer Risk characterizes carcinogenic health risks based on individual exposure to 140 air pollutants. The EPA's framework for assessing and managing these risks, the dose response assessment, details unit risk estimates, inhalation reference concentrations, and risk characterization. A lifetime cancer risk indicator will highlight the direct health risks to marginalized communities and identify toxic air pollutant sources that should be prioritized in environmental justice remediation. Since the early colonists' arrival, the Chesapeake region is known for its unique variety of fish species and heritage of seafood along the estuary. In the 1900s, disease, overfishing, and other factors led to an historical decline in the top seafood industries on the bay. Although it may seem the industry has rebounded since, the rapid decline of the wild populations caused unanticipated fluctuations in harvest and high price demand bringing economic hardship on commercial watermen to maintain a livelihood solely in fisheries. Due to these drastic decreases, fishery-reliant communities suffer economic decline with little time to recover. These historical communities and marine occupations are the backbone of the evolution of the Chesapeake Bay and now lead little hope in restoration of wild populations and coastal homage. Therefore, a commercial fishing indicator could depict coastal communities' ability to respond to the rapid decrease in commercial fishery abundance demonstrated through lower educational attainment and lack of occupation diversity. I am Sarah Jones from the Chesapeake Biological Lab and I will be discussing recreational fishing as a possible indicator of environmental justice. Recreational fishing is an opportunity for individuals to enjoy the outdoors and spend time with family. Recreational fishing is also an example of green space, which promotes mental health, well being, and physical health. Unfortunately, recreational fishing is not accessible to everyone, as there are obstacles such as the lack of free public access fishing sites and annual fees to obtain a fishing license. Therefore, recreational fishing may be an environmental justice indicator in which low-income communities are disadvantaged due to lack of funds to obtain a state fishing license or to enter a facility to fish. The potential indicators for recreational fishing includes license-free fishing areas provided by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Angler Access Map.
Chesapeake Bay and its watershed is home to dense and diverse human populations, as well as a plethora of wildlife, including the charismatic megafauna bottlenose dolphins. Like access to green space, exposure to these animals has the potential to improve the mental health of those who experience it. Dolphin presence is also an indicator of a healthy bay ecosystem. However, access to viewing these interesting creatures is dependent on either access to the waterfront or a boat, both of which are often related to socioeconomic status. Sightings of these animals are easily accessible via Chesapeake Dolphin Watch and could be used as an indicator in conjunction with the measure of access to green space. Best management practices are a multi-million dollar effort throughout the Chesapeake Bay region to improve water quality in the Bay. While they have additive large-scale benefits on Bay health, on a project-to-project -project basis, their impacts are most widely recognized at local scales. For example, best management practices such as forest plantings are the suggested approach to protecting important archaeological and historic sites from climate change damage. However, primary data analysis suggests that BMP's best management practices are the most likely to be funded or installed in voting districts and neighborhoods that are predominantly white, suggesting a glaring environmental justice issue throughout the watershed. Therefore, we propose further investigating the geospatial and economic distribution of BMP projects and comparing these locations to local demographics in order to quantify the discrepancy between communities receiving BMP funding and those that have been historically underserved or ignored, specifically Black communities. Hi, I'm Katrina Kelly with the University of Maryland Eastern Shore to talk about the importance of governance. The 1960s environmental justice movement has recently gone mainstream, sparking debate about restoring equity to an historically imbalanced system. Much research has been devoted to the physical environment and its unevenly distributed climate change pressures, but less focus has been placed on those living within these phenomena. Coastal flooding, frequent and extreme storm events, and CO2 in the atmosphere have uniquely severe impacts on BIPOC and lower income communities. Creating further marginalization is the exclusion from the decision making process that determines the allocation of resources, infrastructure, and interventions that are executed on their behalf. So improving the political and practical agency of these communities through inclusive governance and zoning approaches represent vital indicators of environmental justice that have rarely existed previously. Hi, my name is Taylor Gideon. I'm from the Mies program at the University of Maryland College Park, and I will be discussing our progress thus far. So the first part of our outreach has been through the creation of blogs on the Ian website by students. Each blog summarizes our class discussions and project progress and outlines any important takeaways from that day, often from class discussion. On the slides, you can see a sampling of some of the blogs students have produced so far. So we want to utilize meaningful stakeholder engagement to increase stakeholder influence on our research. This is a continuous process where we inform, consult, involve, collaborate, and aim to empower communities. But all actions can have positive and negative implications for different groups. Failing to involve locals can lead to lack of legitimacy, opposition, and even active undermining of policies or programs. The ineffective application of collaborative approaches may also simply reproduce previous injustices, inappropriate representation, uneven power dynamics, and a lack of equity and legitimacy. So to promote meaningful stakeholder engagement, here's a brief outline of our process and our progress so far. So first with mapping key stakeholders, we wanna know their interest level and their influence level because this will inform how we should engage with different groups. The next step is designing a newsletter where we've described the environmental justice indicators the class developed and described using the and but therefore format. And these were introduced to you in the previous video. Next, we plan to design a survey which will address initial data collection on the views of the indicators presented rankings of importance, open-ended questions for areas we may not have considered, and vignettes for personal stories. Next, we aim to run a workshop to invite representatives from all different stakeholder groups, encourage open conversation, welcome anonymous comments, 
and provide the opportunity for community members to share their perspectives with government and industry. And finally, we would like to engage in semi-structured interviews, which would be open-ended questions. So interviewees are free to bring up any topics and the interviewer can probe for deeper understanding. And again, we will likely learn of more considerations and environmental justice issues. I am Andrea Miralles Barbosa, and I will be discussing our next steps in this project. Um, so as our team quickly realized throughout the semester, an EJ index and the actions that would result from an index, those things are on a one semester task. Um, so we decided that this should be a longer term project in order to truly capture the data necessary and to allow for that really good, meaningful input of a variety of stakeholder groups. Um, so to do this, we built a multi-phased approach, as you can see here on the screen, um, that would allow for the development of a more comprehensive index that tries to do justice to capturing these really complex issues of injustice. So phase one is the phase we're currently in, and it's the representative indicator development phase. I mean, in this phase, the goal is basically to take our findings thus far, um, have these initial conversations with a variety of stakeholder groups, and disseminate those findings in order to gain support for this initiative. Then phase two, well, which will take place over the next year or so, is the meaningful stakeholder engagement phase, um, where we continue this course and undertake human subject research so that we can co-produce our indicators for the index with communities, um, with groups who do environmental justice work, and with those who may have less experience in environmental justice work, but who do work in these sort of environmental spaces. Finally, phase three, or the progressive integrated action phase is the phase where we use the tool that we've created. So using this index to collaboratively develop action plans and to make data calls, right? Um, so, so what we think it, it is really important to do is to end this project by actually using the index to identify actionable pathways that ensure a more just future for this region.